Our Father God, again, we come to you today. We thank you for the many blessings, Father, you have given us this past week. And Father, what a glorious thought to have that you walked with us, that you came to us in Bible study, you came to us in prayer time, you comfort us, you give us strength, you encourage our hearts. And now, Father, we ask that you be with us as we have gathered here in this time of worship, in this time of celebration, that we turn our worship, Father, to your word. And that as we open your word, we ask that your Holy Spirit be our teacher, that he would be our comforter, that he would be our strength today, that every heart would be open to receive his message, that every heart would be open to be filled to overflowing, and that every individual father would leave this place saying not only it was good to be in the house of the Lord, but that it was good to be in your presence. Oh, Father, people do need the Lord. And we need you in our everyday life and strength that we might be encouraged, we might be given, given hope. Be with our brothers and sisters all over the world, Father, who do not share our freedom, that are suffering, that are in, in jail or in hiding somewhere because of their faith. Oh, Father, give them strength. Let your presence be near them in a special way and encourage them, Father, that we might be encouraged also. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Let's turn into our Bibles to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 31. Hopefully we'll close out this chapter today. Laban and Jacob, what a pair. I think Jacob is going to get more out of this relationship than Laban ever will. I think Laban's going to go back to his old ways, and Laban's not going to understand what the will of God is in his life. But I think Jacob is in his time of changing. God has a way of changing us whether we want it or not. God has a way of bringing circumstances into our life that teach us and change us in the way that he would have us to be. In the book of Romans, it says that all things work to good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And the reason for that is found in verse 29. Keep your ribbon here in Genesis 31, but turn to Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. <clears throat> Almost there. Romans 8, 28 again says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. That's believers, folks. Look at verse 29. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. What it means here, folks, is God is working on you as he is working on me. And that all things that come into our life have a meaning and have a purpose. And that meaning and that purpose is that all these things are used by God in a special way that you and I become more and more like Jesus. Many of us, after we get saved, we think, well, that's the end. That's, that's all that we need to do. I've got my ticket to heaven. I've got my train ticket to glory, and, and I'm ready to go, but now I can just live my life and do what I want to do. But folks, what you must understand that God is in the process of getting you ready. Jacob came to know God there at Bethel. He had gone to Pandam Aram to find a wife to find a woman and also not to get killed by his brother, his twin brother. And so on his way to find a wife and on his way to, to escape his brother, something very interesting happened. He got saved. There, when God opened the heaven and showed him there upon that place at Bethel, uh, the ladder that came down and God showed him the purpose and plan for his life, and Jacob says, I want to be a part of God. And Jacob got saved. But you see, Jacob had to go and get the Laban taken out of him. You ever gone to the hospital? Many of you have. I see some, I've seen some of you in the hospital. And so you went to the doctors and you said to the doctors, Doctor, I've come and I want you to take the Laban out of me. 
Now, the doctor's going to say, what? It's like the doctor one time I said, he said, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing real good, doctor. And he says, I said, I'll accept for that disease I have. He says, what disease do you have? I said, I got that furniture disease. And he says, what's that? I said, well, my chest dropped in my drawers. <laughs> and for the longest time, he, th he was thinking furniture disease, furniture disease. The doctor, the doctor didn't know. And so if you go to the doctor this week and you say, I want you to take the Laban out, he's not going to understand either. But God knows what he's doing with your life. God knows the ending before the beginning. God knows what you need to be taken out of your life before you even know that. And so many times we go down the same road because we didn't listen the first time. Or sometimes we go down another road because, well, Uncle Laban just kind of stayed with us. And God says, I'm wanting to take the Laban out of you because you remember, Jacob was a schemer. And Jacob had more Laban in him than he realized. And here we have at the end of the journey, so to speak, pretty close to the end of the journey. And Jacob has left Laban. He has said, I don't want any more of the tricks. I don't want any more of the, of the smooth talk. I don't want any more of the promises. I'll give you anything you want if you'll just stay. I'm going to take my wives. I'm going to take my children. I'm going to take my possessions and I'm running. And he did. But Laban caught up with him. Do you think you're going to turn the leaf over in January and this is going to do it and this is going to take care of it and I'm going to have everything taken care of? Folks, listen, Laban hasn't left you yet. And he's going to follow you wherever you go. And the problem and the issue is we haven't got our Laban taken out yet. And that's what we're going to see tonight or today. Jacob here <clears throat> is been camped and Laban's chased him down. They've caught each other. And look what Laban is doing here. We see Laban has a covenant that he wants to get with Jacob. Laban is caught up with Jacob and has accused him of stealing from him. You have taken my daughters, my grandchildren. You've taken my flocks. You've taken everything from me. By the way, let me say this to you. If you think you can walk in the world, if you think you can get into the world and if the world will leave you alone, that you can walk out of the world and healthy and wealthy and have everything you want. Folks, let me tell you something. The world is going to exact from you what it wants from you. And Uncle Laban is there with Jacob and he's going to say, look, I want this from you. Jake, Jacob quickly reminds, remember last week, Jacob quickly reminded Uncle Laban, I work for you. These are not your sheep. These are my sheep. I worked for you hard 20 years of my life. 14 for your daughters. I only wanted one, but I had to have, he didn't say that because I think he got to a point he began to love uh, Leah. But he said to them, these are my wives. I work for them. These are my flocks. I work for them too. But you see, the world doesn't care. The world doesn't care what you think. Many years ago when I was in the service, I remember Top being in the, the desk in the office, and I came in, and we were talking, and I said, Top, I think we need to do this. And uh, First Sergeant looked at me and said, you know, if we wanted you to think, we'd have made you an officer. <laughs> and I learned as a 19-year-old boy that the world doesn't care what I believe. The world doesn't care what I think. The world wants to exact from me what it wants. And listen, folks, if we let the world, the world will take our best years of our life. The world will take what little we have and not care and will say, we gave you. You got what you have because we gave it to you. And what Jacob is experiencing here, and he's going to have to stand up to the world. And one day, folks, we have to stand up. One day we have to say enough is enough. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that anymore. And I'm going to break away from this. We're going to have to stand and take a stand for the Lord. And I think the way we see the days are today and things going today, folks, I think it's going to be sooner than we think. But we're going to have to take a stand, as Jacob is going to do today. Let's look, first of all, in verses uh, 43 through 49, the arrogance of Uncle Laban. The world has an arrogance, folks. And I want you to understand, look at verse 43. <clears throat> In verse 43, and Laban answered and said to Jacob. Now, here's what Jacob said. Look, I've worked hard for you. I've done all this myself. This is not yours. Laban answered and said to Jacob, these daughters are my daughters. 
These children are my children. And this flock is my flock, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day to these my daughters or to their children whom they have born? You see, Laban is saying, I came to kill you and take what is mine, rightfully mine, away from you. Folks, you're not getting anything from the world. Look at verse 44. Now therefore come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And then Jacob said to his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they ate there on the heap. And Laban called it Jagar Shahadutha. And Jacob called it Galid. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, its name was called Galid. Also Mizpah, because he said, May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from another. We see here this arrogance of Laban, first of all. We see in verse 43, Laban's insulting revelation. Jacob said, I have worked for you. I've done all this. And by the way, the world will work you. The world will work you. They will exact from you everything they can get from you. They will make you stay longer than you want to stay. They'll make you pay more than you're willing to pay. And they'll get from you everything they can and, they, and if, you're, if you're spent and you're wore out and you're done, it's okay. We can find somebody else. There's no more gold watches, folks, anymore. Those days are over. The world doesn't care. And so let me say this to you. I want you to work. I want you to do your job. I want you to do it right. I want you to do the best you can, just like Jacob did. But understand, what you've got is given to you by God. What you have, the Lord has provided for you. What you are able to do, God even gave you the ability in your mind to do it. He gave you the skills of your hand that you would be able to do it. Jacob, everything Jacob had was given to him by God, not by Laban. But Laban says, it's mine. I gave it to you. It is mine. It belongs to me. We see his defensive response. Jacob says, you've stolen from me. I've worked hard for you. I did everything I could for you. I've done everything right. And Laban says, these are my daughters. You know, that's pretty hard letting your children go, isn't it? But you see, Laban said, these are my daughters. They belong to me. So he's basically disavowing Jacob's marriage covenant here, or trying to. He said, these sons are mine. These grandchildren are mine. You know, it's kind of backwards today. We like to say, hey, let's sugar them up, and give them a couple of bottles of pop and sit them on back, you know, and you can have them after that. Laban said, these children are mine. Why? Because he wants workers in the field. He didn't care about his grandkids. If he did, he would spend time with them before. We see his disingenuous remarks here in verse 43. He says, But what can I do this day to these, my daughters, or their children whom they have born? He's saying, what can I do to them? If I I kill you, I, I hurt them. If I destroy you, I hurt them. And so we see here his hypocritical answer. Because he still cannot say, I was wrong. Folks, you're not going to get the world to say it's wrong. You're not going to win. You're going to say, well, I'm going to stay with this. I'm going to do what I want to do. And the world is going to say to me, we're sorry. We were wrong. We should pay you this extra. We should give you. Listen, folks, the world is going to extract from you exactly what it can get from you. And it's not going to apologize. So don't expect an apology. You live for the Lord. You work in the real world. You live in the real world. But you understand that what you have and all that you have is given to you by God. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. These daughters didn't belong to Laban, they belonged to God. These children didn't belong to Laban or even Jacob, they belonged to God. The flocks didn't belong to Laban or Jacob, they belonged to God. Everything on the earth, the earth is the Lord's, as the NIV puts it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it and all that dwell therein. Folks, this building belongs to God. Your life belongs to God. Those cars you drove today belong to God. The house you live in belongs to God. The children that you raise belong to God. The grandchildren you're entrusted with, they belong to God. But you see, the world says they're mine. The world says it's ours. 
and the world will fight you for it, just like Laban here is fighting Jacob. Jacob's going to have to stand up. In verse 44, we see Laban's insincere recommendations. Let's make a covenant. Remember before when Jacob said, I'm going to leave? You know, don't tell me anything, I'm going to leave. And here Laban says to him, very simple, well, I know how to get to you. He says, name your price. What can I give you? If you'll stay and work with me, I'll pay you whatever you want. He knew Jacob had a price. And the question is, what price are you willing to pay to the world to get what you think they're going to give you? That later on, they're going to come back and say, it's mine anyway. I want it back. The world gives you nothing, folks. The world is going to try to take it back. And you have to fight for everything you have. Your treasures, we talked about this last week. Your treasure is not that car out there. Your treasure is not the house. Your treasure is not the, your income, your bank account, your savings account, anything else you have. That's not your treasure, folks. You look around, this is the treasure. Your children are your treasure. Your grandchildren are your treasure. Your family members, your friends are your treasure. People are the treasure of the Lord, folks. The devil's already told you the treasure is in something else. And he's already told you those children are mine. The world's already told you those grandkids are mine. Leave them alone. And you see, we have to fight for them. If you think you're going to get them without a fight, you're mistaken. You've already lost. Laban's opportune offer was simple. After, after this, he says, okay, I've given you the bad news, but I want to give you the good news. Let's make, it, let's make a treaty. Let's make a covenant. You know, after the Trojan War, it was said, very simply, beware of Greeks who bear gifts. <laughs> you have to be careful if the world is willing to give you something. Because there is a price tag. There is a string attached. And yes, you better read the small print. Because it does work that way. How many times have people today sold their soul for the, the world, done their, what they need to do to get fame and fortune, and when they got to the top of the ladder, they realized it was the biggest mistake they made in their life? If this is not true, why aren't there more rich people that are happy? If this is true, why aren't there more famous people that are happy? There are famous people that would give their fortune just to be able to walk into Walmart and shop. There are people today, folks, who believe the lie and they've got all they've got and they wish they had a different life. They wish they could trade with you in a heartbeat. The world has a different opportunity. Laban's obvious omission is simple. He makes an omission here. Look here in verse 4. Now, therefore, come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. Where's the children at? Where's the daughters at? Where's the flocks at? There's an omission here. You see, an agreement made in the world is not always total. It's not always totally trustable. It's not all, you've got to be careful. It's like, it's like talking to some fast salesman. You've got to listen to every word, and you've got to be able to understand everything you say before you sign the dotted line. Uncle Laban's just that way, and that's the way the world is. We see the arrogance of Uncle Laban. Next, in verse 45 and through 49, we see the accommodation of Jacob. Jacob says, okay, I'll, I'll show you what I'll do. In verse 45 and 46, we see the conduct of leadership. Jacob has grown by this time. Jacob now is understanding Uncle Laban isn't always what, uh, what Uncle Laban appears to be. In verse 45 and 46, we see the conduct of leadership. He says, so Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Have we seen that before? Jacob has done this before. Remember the pillar there at, at Bethel? He laid his head. He was tired. He was wor worn out by the journey. And he laid down, didn't have a pillow to take with him. I hate hotel pillows. Well, anymore today, they do a little different. They give you a hard one, they give you a soft one, and then they give you a softer one. Okay, it's, it's, the, it's the three bears principles, you know. Not so hard, not so thin. This one's just right, you know. I hate them. I end up putting three pillows on top of each other. It's terrible. And then I have a neck pain the rest of the, the trip, you know. You've got to be careful what Uncle Laban is doing here. You've got to be careful about what the situation is. You've got to know what's going on here. 
So we see Jacob, he's gone to Bethel and he's found a pillow and the pillow was a stone, a hard pillow. And it's given him a vision that night. He sees the angels coming down and going up the, the uh, ladder and he says, look, I have come, I've been into the house of God. And so he takes that pillow that he uses and he sets it up on the end of itself. And he says, and he pours oil on it and he dedicates the place. This is the house of God. Jacob gets saved. Jacob says, I am now in the house of God. You know, that's one thing for a new believer, isn't it? To be in the house of God. So Jacob says, okay, here's what we're going to do, Uncle Laban. Bingo. We're going to do what I did back at Bethel. This may not be Bethel, but this is a place where I'm going to say, this is church. Now we're going to make this decision my way. We see his marker of sincerity. It was for Jacob himself. The Bible says, so Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Laban didn't do this. Jacob did. Jacob says, look, Laban, I'm a, I'm a child of God. I'm a believer. And then Jacob said to his brethren, now that's not the Laban's friends. Laban's family has come to kill him. Remember all the, the kids came quick. They, Uncle Laban called the, the boys and they all came. They got on their camels and they rode and they caught up with Jacob and they were going to kill him. So Jacob's not saying to the boy, other boys, hey, come and be with us. He's saying to his sons and his grandsons. And Jacob said to his brethren, folks, as a Christian, you need to understand you must be able to trust your brethren. You must be able to trust the family of God. So they said, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they ate there on the heap. They must have been Baptists, huh? And they took stones and made a heap. What did they do? They made a big pile of stones. They didn't, they didn't build a building. They didn't do anything. They just made a big heap of stones. You know why? Because church isn't the stones, is it? It's you and me. Paul called us stones. He said, we're foundation. Jesus is the foundation, and we build on it, and we're stones fit together into a building. So the heap was just an edifice structure to use to bring everybody together, just like this building is too. Jacob has said, let's, let's throw these stones together and let's have church. And Jacob is worshiping God. He says, we're going to do this my way, Laban. So we see his marker of sincerity and his mound of sincerity for Jacob's family, but look also in verse 46, we see a meal of sincerity. In verse 46, and they ate there on the heap. You see, the meal was a part of the ceremony of the covenant. Why is it? Because you can't have church without fellowship, folks. You know how hard it is? Imagine if all the football players sat on the bench. The coach says, okay, guys, we're going to go out there and we're going to beat these people. We're going to win. We're going to go out there. All right, let's go. And they all go out there and sit on the bench. And the other team goes out there and, and they're waiting for the team to come out. And they go, well, I'm not going out there. I don't need to be there. You know, I'm not a part of that. Uh, you know, I didn't practice hard. I didn't do this. I didn't, you know, I, this is my only day to sleep in. And the coach says, wait a minute. I thought you wanted to play football. I thought you wanted to be a part of the game. I thought you wanted to be a part of this whole thing. I thought you wanted the benefit of this whole thing. And see, what we see here is that the meal is the time of fellowship. And we come here to feast upon God's word. We come here to... The, the food may not be the best food in the world. I think it's great myself, by the way, when we have these wonderful get-togethers. But you know what's even better? The fellowship. Just like we went to Spyro Saturday, we got out there. It was early morning, 8 o'clock, big deal. We got there. We had a good time. We fellowshiped. We laughed. We looked what everybody was eating and thought, man, that's a heart attack waiting to happen right there, you know? We had fun. We, we laughed. We talked serious, but we, then we talked a lot of things about uh, our life and things of that nature. But you know what? That's fellowship. We come to church. We have fellowship. Next, in verse 47 through 49, we see the contempt of Laban. What does Laban say? In verse 47 and 48, we see his consensus of witness. <clears throat> so Laban called it Jagar Shahadutha, but Jacob called it Galid. And Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, its name was called Galid. 
Verse 49, also mitzvah, because he said, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from another. Doesn't that sound sweet? We see in verse 47 and 48 a consensus of witness. Laban used the words of the world, but Jacob used the language of God's people. So Laban says, okay, you got your church building, let's call it what it is. And he used the language of the world. Jacob understood what Laban was saying. And Laban says, I'm not going to call it this God's house. This is just a place. And Jacob says, no, it's going to be Galid, the language of my, of my people, of God's people. And Laban said, okay, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, its name shall be Galid. All right, all right, we'll call it Galid. We'll call it a church. Big deal. But he said, also, I want to call it mitzvah. Now, why? We see it's a caution of watching. He says, this is not just a heap of stones. This is a watchtower. Mitzvah means watchtower. The word galid means heap of stones. It was like, like a, a mound that basically was a boundary maker. But he said, I want a watchtower here. And oh, how many times have you seen those, those little medallions that you wear, the, the little round things are torn in half. God watched between you and me when we were absent from one another. And we've made it a very wonderful, beautiful thing. But in reality, what, what Laban is saying here is I'm going to be watching you when we're absent. I'm going to make sure this heap is here to keep you in line, Jacob. You see, this was not a watchtower. It was a heap. It was a boundary maker. But Laban is feigning spirituality in verse 49 by making this a God thing. Because in verse 50, you've got to connect the two folks. We're going to see this in a moment. In verse 50, he falsely accuses Jacob of terrible things. He said, I'm going to have God watch you because I know what kind of person you are, Jacob. You're a wife beater. You're a child abuser. Jacob, you don't do the right thing, so we're going to see this heap. You made this heap. You did this pillar. You look real good spiritual, Jacob, but I know what kind of worm you are. All these were lies, by the way. How do you fight a lie? How do you fight an accusation like that? We see it was, it was a, a watch, it, to him it was a watchtower, but to Joseph it was a, or excuse me, not to Joseph, but to Jacob it was a boundary maker. Jacob says, I'm not going beyond this. In Genesis 31 through 50, we see an oath and we see an offering. But look at verse 50 as we carry on through this with Laban's contempt. In verse 50, he says, and if you afflict my daughters. That's kind of like saying, is this the stick you beat your wife with? No, no, that's not the stick. What do you mean it's not the stick? Where's the stick at then? How do you answer a question like that? Is this the stick you beat your wife with? Well, that don't make any sense. I don't beat my wife. So this is not the stick. Where is it at? You see, you can't win with that. So he says to him, very simply, verse 50, if you afflict my daughters, or if you take other wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Your God is going to take care of you if you do these things. We see his implication of Jacob in regard to, to, to domestic abuse. Jacob never abused his wives. He loved his wife. Now, we always talk, we already talked about the polygamy matter and all of that. But you see, Jacob made a promise. He made an oath. He married Leah. Laban had cheated him out of that one. He didn't want to marry Leah. He wanted to marry Rachel. But you see, what he did, he cheated him. And so Laban's the one who was cheating. Laban was the one who was abusing. But you see, Laban says here, okay, I don't want you to abuse your wives anymore. And God's going to watch us. Because of this, he's going to watch you. So he's accusing Jacob. And then we see his in, uh, insinuation of Jacob. He, Jacob has more desires for more wives. Are you going to have more wives when you get back to the homeland? You're going to pick up another four or five wives? What's going on? We understand Jacob's wives talked him into marrying his wife's servants. So now Jacob has four. Let me say this to you folks. The world is always going to come to a point it's going to point out your sin. 
It's always going to point out your sins. You see, the world gets to know you pretty good, and the world gets to know because they've already talked you into it. The world's already talked you into doing this stuff. The world's already talked you into being what they want you to be. You've already walked the walk with the world, but you see, here's what the world does. As soon as you try turning around, the world says, oh, are you going to turn around? What about such and such? You see, you're just like us. And that's what Laban is saying. You're just like me, Jacob. Even though you're going for God and you're going back to God country and all that stuff, you're just like us, Jacob. Your God's going to see you the way you are. So we see here what the world is doing to Jacob. The insinuation. But then he has the insult of Jacob. And what's the insult? He brings God into the matter in verse 50. You see, God is witness between you and me. Your God knows the truth, Jacob. I mean, Jacob's astounded. What do you say to that? How do you answer that? How does Jacob say, well, what are you talking about? All the kids are standing around the fireplace. Uh, Laban's family's going, whoa, what a bad guy. I knew that uh, brother-in-law was an idiot. And all the kids are looking at Dan and saying, what? What's going on? How do you answer that? You see, the world will bless you one minute and it'll curse you the next. You think the world's your friend? The world will bless you one moment, and it will curse you the next. We see now in verse 51 and 52, Laban's deceptive response. We see here his remarks, his deplorable remarks in verse 50, but look at his deceptive remarks in verse 51 and 52. And then Laban said to Jacob, Here is this heap, and here is this pillar, which I have placed between you and me. Laban fixes one of himself. Laban says, okay, I'm going to put up a pillar, and I'm going, to, I'm going to bring my boys in, and they're going to throw up a heap. There was a lot of heap of things going on that day, wasn't there? You see, the world is always going to feign their spirituality. Well, you're no different than me. You're just like me. You're no better than me. I'm going to put up my pillar, and I'm going to put up my heap. We see the marker of protection. You see, Laban is accusing Jacob of future possible harm of himself. So here is this heap and here is this pillar which I have placed between you and me. (laughs) This heap is a witness and this pillar is a witness that I will not pass beyond this heap to you and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for harm. What he's saying is he says, I've got this marker of protection and I've got this mound of peace and I'm going to bring peace into this situation without God but you're not going to come after me, Jacob. You see, the world's pretense always covers their true intention. This is really the true intention of the world. Jesus said the world hates you. He says, don't be surprised. Marvel not that the world hates you. It hated me first. Jesus said the world hates you. Don't don't be surprised by that. This system that we call the world, now I'm not talking about the earth, the planet, and the nice, the nice uh, mountains and the nice forests and the glades and the, the, all the beaches and everything, that beautiful world that we live in. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the world system. Well, I shared with you last week, the world, one of the world's commandments was do unto others before they do unto you. You know, get what you can get out of life, grab for the old, if you want to know what the world system is all about. Do is watch the commercials on TV. If you really want to know what the world system is all about, all you've got to do is watch the commercials on the TV. Grab for all the gusto you can get. Get it now while you can. Doesn't matter how you do it, just grab for it now. And the world goes for those who will grab it. Verse 53, we see Laban's deplorable ratification. What he does in verse 53 is very uh, sensible for him. He says, let the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their father judge between us. What he's saying is, we're going to put all the gods together here. Syncretism, the combination of different forms of belief. It's okay you want to believe in this God of Abraham thing. It's okay if you want to believe in this Jesus stuff. It's all right, but you got to understand, don't get bent out of shape. We got Buddha, we got Muhammad, we got Shintoism, Taoism, we got everything else. They got their many way pathways to heaven. Baloney. Jesus said, I am the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh the Father but by me. Here is the Son of God telling us that all these other religions are false religions. You can't get around that, folks. The world says, 
oh, it's okay, be what you want to be, but listen, no one's better than me. I've got my thing, you've got yours. See, it's a pagan compromise. He's tricking him into this in verse 53. The God of Abraham, the God of Naor, that's their father who was the idol maker, and the God of their father judge between us. Now look at this, what Jacob does. And Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Jacob did not swear by the God of Naor. We see here a pagan compromise, but a proper confirmation. Jacob did not fall for the world's compromise. An oath on a false God is no oath at all. Jacob did not swear by the God of Naor to elevate the God of Naor to the level of the fear of Isaac, his father. He swore by Isaac's awe and reverence for God. What's that all about, the fear of Isaac? We saw that in last week. They had that same thing too. What the fear of Isaac was, Isaac was obedient to God. Isaac was not a child. We see these pictures of these little small teenage boys being hauled up on an altar with Abraham's big knife. This was a full-grown 30 to 40-year-old man who was put on the altar. And he gave his life for God. He said, all right, I'll give it. I'll give it for God. I'll give it for God. I'll go. I'll do what my father says. And it was his fear and his awe of God that kept him on the altar. He could have easily overcome his father. But you see, it was the fear and awe of God in Jacob's life that he said to them, I'll swear by that. And then we see the offering of the covenant. We see the oath. Once again, Laban's trying to get him to compromise the oath even. He gives him the oath. And then verse 54 and 55, we see the offering of the covenant. And then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brother to eat bread. And they ate bread and stayed all night on the mountain. Oh, I like the mountaintop experiences, don't you? Man, I, 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 there's a lot of preachers that like the mountaintop experiences. They'll go from one mountain to the next. They'll go from one, one workshop to the other workshop, from one seminar, one conference to another. Man, it's exciting to go there. I remember once a year we'd have pastor's conference in our church in Florida, and there would be probably 4,000 pastors there from all over the country. As far as up in Alaska, we even had people coming from out of the country to come in. Man, it was exciting. Preachers were wonderful. The singing was great. Man, it was all exciting. It was like you were there at heaven. It was unbelievable. And then the day they left, it was like, oh, hum, we're back again, aren't we? And folks, you got to come down from the mountain sometime. But it's great to be on the mountain. We see a time for dedication. It was a Thanksgiving offering. All my Jewish commentaries that I read said this was a Thanksgiving offering. The offering that was made, Jacob said, we're going to thank God. Thank God we've overcome the world. Thank God we're able to live for God. Remember when the, 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 in the book of Revelation, when the martyrs stand before God and they thank God. They said that they would give, they thank God that he was, they were even able to give their life for him. It's a time for dedication. There was an occasion for consecration. We see the offering was to God first. What have you given God first in your life, folks? You know, God doesn't want the things you have. Our God doesn't need things. You're the joy of God's life. You're the reward. You're the treasure of God's life. He wants you. He wants to see you grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He wants to see you live for him. You are the treasure. He's got streets made of gold, for goodness sake. We see an occasion for consecration. Give your best to God first, beloved. That's how you're going to love God. Give your best to God first. And then we see an opportunity for communion. Then they had bread. Do you see that? They already had the meal. Remember back a while? They already had the meal. And now they have the bread. Well, what's this with bread after the meal? You know, one of the most interesting things about the communion service is that it was a part of the, the Passover. It was a part of the Passover. And the Bible says that Jesus took the bread after the meal. You see, according to the Passover, you ate nothing past the lamb. 
Once you ate the lamb, you ate nothing else. You wanted a taste of the lamb in your mouth through the rest of the Passover service. But Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, Take, eat, this is my body and it is broken for you. Take and eat it in remembrance of me. And oh, Jacob says to his brethren, I want you to remember this day. We have consecrated ourselves to God. We have given first to God. Now I want you to understand this bread that we're going to eat is going to remind us every day of this opportunity we've had to go back to be with God. Oh, Christian, how many times have we come to this communion table and remembered what God has done for us? And it's the bread that we hold and that we eat that reminds us that God loved us and Jesus loved us. And the bread here was given to them and they ate the bread and they stayed all night on the mountain. Oh, they talked about the good times. Tell us, Jacob, what it's like to be back at our father's house. Tell us what it's like to be back with, with the family. Oh, Jacob says it's wonderful. You ought to hear how they walked with God. You ought to hear how my grandfather told us about how God spoke to him. And he left that pagan land and got saved and came to this new land. Oh, beloved, isn't it great to come to God's house and be with God's people and fellowship with God's people and hear about how lives were changed and lives made new. Look at verse 55, a time for departure. And early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his sons and daughters and blessed them. And then Laban departed and returned to his place. We see a time of departure, Laban's restrained blessing. Notice that Laban didn't kiss Jacob. Notice that Laban didn't bless Jacob. Why? Because Jacob beat him. You see, when you live for God and you have close communion with God, you beat the world. And the world hates you for that. That's why they think you're crazy. You go to church. That's why they think you're crazy because you read your Bible. That's why they think you're crazy. You rather do things for God than for the other people, for the world. We see Laban's restrained blessing. But look at Laban's, re Laban's return back, back to paganism, back to living outside godly influence. Back to no more saucer blessings. Remember, I talked about that last week, how there are a lot of people in life because they're not Christians, they're not born again. They receive saucer blessings of Christians. Folks, there are people in this world, in this country, in America, who have been living off of saucer blessings. Not the cup blessings, but the saucer underneath it. Because Christians all this time in our history of our country have had their cup overflowing and God has blessed them and these people have lived off of saucer blessings but when they get rid of the Christians and they get rid of the, of the Christ-like influence in our country, there'll be no more saucer blessings. And it'll be a world of paganism and a country of, of uh, paganism. You see, Laban went back all those 20 years when Jacob was there he had great and plenty. He had wonderful, wonderful time. He had blessings untold before. Never had blessings like that before. But now that Jacob is gone, Laban goes back with his own children and he knows the good days are gone. One day, folks, when God takes us from this world, the rapture comes and the church is gone. This world is going to wonder what we, we, what's happened. The saucer blessings are going to be gone. Folks, there is victory over the world. Jacob is not perfect. Jacob's got to go through a lot yet to get, to get to the land of his fathers. He's going to wrestle with God in just a little bit. He's going to have his name changed. Oh, beloved, have you ever wrestled with God? We're going to have a, a wrestling match with God in just a little bit. And you know what it does? It changes you. It makes you walk different. It gives you a new name. But let me say this to you, Jacob's got a lot yet to come, but he's starting back home. Coming home, coming home, never more to roam. What a wonderful song that would be for Jacob that day. But you see, God will have to test Jacob. and God will have to repair, uh, re prepare him for the return. God is preparing us, folks, each and every day 
for the return yet to come. Laban had a covenant, but God had a purpose for Jacob's life. I'd rather have God's covenant than Laban's, wouldn't you? Is God working on you today? Is God removing the Laban out of your life today? Folks, the Bible tells us that there's a world better yet to come. The Bible tells us this world will use us, but Jesus loves us. The Bible tells us that we can be saved and born again and have a new life and a new journey. The Bible tells us that Jacob is on his way home. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time you've given us. More especially, Father, as we have searched your word, it is your word, it is your Holy Spirit who taught our hearts today. As this old frail voice spoke out its message, Father, and shared the word, your Holy Spirit applied it to our hearts. You spoke to each and every one of us with that still, small voice. Father, there might be someone here today without Jesus. They've never had their Bethel experience. They've never met God and been saved and born again and had their sins forgiven and a new life given to them, a new hope. And Father, if they would just come and take me by the hand today in this time of decision and say, Pastor, I want to be saved. I want to be born again. I want to have a new life and I want to start over and I want to have forgiveness of all my sins. Father God, we'd show them in the Bible how they could have that. And Father, there are some Jacobs today who have Uncle Laban chasing them and the, the world is seeking to, to keep them and to, to remind them that they're no different than they are. But Father, your love and your grace and your mercy is greater yet and still give those Christians strength to come home. Father, there are those Christians who need to come and pray. They need to pray for family members and for friends and for themselves. Whatever decision is to be done today, Father God, let it be done according to your word and your timing. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.